Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the India's, I guess, somewhat failed, at least according to the media, Chandrayaan 2 mission. And today I wanted to focus on the successes of the mission because, well, I don't think it failed. I don't think most of the space scientists in India think it failed. Only the media thinks so. Anyway, let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So the Chandrayaan-2 mission, as the name suggests, is the second part of the Indian exploration of the moon. If you don't really know much about the first mission, um, in brief, it was actually a very exciting time for India because it was able to launch um, a completely autonomous, in a sense that they did it completely by themselves, mission to the moon that was not very expensive and was actually the first time ever that we uh, discovered and confirmed that the moon has quite a lot of water on the surface. Now, moon obviously doesn't have very hospitable conditions for water, so the water that we discovered was very likely either deposited inside the rocks or possibly in form of ice hidden in very, very dark crevices in various craters that basically never see sunlight, specifically usually craters in the polar region. Now, having discovered water, um, or actually confirmed the existence of water on the surface, they decided to follow this up with another mission, Chandrayaan-2. Now, the first mission happened, um, I guess, about a decade ago from now. And, oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, this is not the first time we discovered water. The first discovery of water came from the Soviet mission in 1976 that brought back the lunar rock, so-called regolith, that um, contained water molecules on the inside but Indians were the first to detect it on the surface, and they've decided to plan a second part of the mission with uh, Russian help. Unfortunately, about three, no, actually four years ago, the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, decided to sort of abandon this mission. I don't really know the details, but um, the Indians were quite disappointed because the Russians were responsible for building the lander. Now, um, which part do we know failed? It's the lander. Now, I don't want to blame the Russians uh, for this, but the thing is, this technically was made by Indians in about three years of research and development, and unfortunately, this was the weakest link of the entire mission. They just didn't have the experience to build this, unfortunately. Three years um, is just not enough to come up with a successful lander that um, is going to succeed on the first try. It took the Soviets and the Americans several decades to successfully land on the moon. And so rather than putting a blame on someone, I guess the main idea here is that um, the fact that the actual lander failed is just simply inevitable. It's something that um, many people expected to happen because uh, not enough time was put into the preparation. But here's the thing though, the part of the lander itself and also the rover were never really meant to be um, a big deal anyway. They were supposed to only function for about two weeks before their battery ran out. Neither one of these was designed to withstand the lunar night which lasts for two weeks. So it was really not about the lander or the rover at all. It was just a kind of a demonstration of the capability of landing on the surface. And I think for the most part, um, India showed quite a lot of capability. Um, the only failure happened only in the last few seconds of the landing, when the lander unfortunately decided to do a little flip and fired its engines the wrong way. But the most important part of the mission, the actual orbiter that you see on the screen right here, is still functioning fully and is fully operational and is currently doing its mission at, as far as I know, 100%. This is the main part of the mission. This is why they went to the moon to begin with. Because the main purpose of the Chandrayaan-2 mission is to actually very accurately map the moon and the presence of water uh, on the moon. Specifically, they want to develop, I guess you can call it the water map. This map is going to be the first such map in existence and it's already going to be a very, very impressive achievement. For this particular mission, uh, as you can see, the um, orbiter is going to be moving around the moon along its polar region in order for the various detectors on board the probe to map the surface of the moon entirely. Now, why polar orbit? Well, because if I were to add the craft here, 
as a kind of a demonstration. And so here is a probe moving around the moon in an equatorial orbit. Here you'll notice that it does do a good job mapping the equator, but this doesn't help us with the other regions. Now watch what happens if we actually place the probe in a polar or more polar region. Here, um, as the probe orbits around the moon, it will actually get to map the entire surface eventually, in uh, little stripes of course, but eventually it will be able to cover pretty much the entire surface, given enough time. Which is why its mission is, is going to last for a few years. All of these stripes will eventually combine into a total map. Now that's not to say that this uh, lander was completely useless, because it did have a few sensors on the inside. Um, from what I remember, they had a seismometer to measure the moonquakes. They also had a way to measure X-ray radiation, plasma, and um, also alpha particles, or basically different types of radiation, on the surface of the moon. But like I said, it would only last for two weeks. That's just not enough to really have any consistent data. Because of this, this particular part of the mission was really more for just a proof of concept rather than actual science. Because the science is still going on and is going to definitely change our understanding of the moon for good. And the orbiter itself is actually pretty complex. It has at least eight different payloads, in other words, eight different sensors, all of them very advanced with one specifically being able to detect radiation from various types of ice that might be hiding here, but also from various types of hydroxide or water molecules. So in other words, um, the mission will be able to detect all sorts of water hiding pretty much everywhere on the surface and even beneath the surface, several meters beneath. Because some of the sensors will be able to penetrate the surface up to several meters and see what's inside as well. So in other words, um, in a few years, possibly by around 2026, because the mission here will take about seven years, we'll have a very thorough map of the surface of the moon and where all of the water is hiding. Now, obviously this is really important to us because we're planning to have all of these uh, manned mission here. And for a manned mission to succeed, we need to find where we can find water on the surface instead of bringing it with us every time. Because, you know, water is pretty heavy. If you think carrying a few um, water bottles from a store is difficult, try carrying all of the water you need to survive on the moon with you in a spacecraft that's coming from Earth. That would be very inefficient and very difficult to achieve. And of all of the instruments on board of the orbiter, I think some of them definitely make it one of the more exciting lunar missions to date. So obviously there is a very highly um, detailed camera. There's also a camera capable of creating a 3D map of the moon, although we've already had one from the uh, lunar orbiter from NASA, but uh, this one here is going to be more detailed. There's also a very, very advanced um, infrared imager capable of detecting radiation that was not available to us until now. And specifically here, we're going to be able to see if there are some other unusual atoms and molecules hiding on the surface and possibly even discover some other molecules we didn't really expect to find. Simply because we'll be able to see their spectrum that was previously not available to us simply because the actual cameras didn't exist or the um, probes didn't have them on board. And overall, I think it's definitely a very exciting mission. It's um, something I'm looking forward to hear more about. And because for me, it's really all about science and discoveries, this is where the mission starts. We have about seven years to go before we finally get the map of the moon itself. But I'm sure in between the uh, mission and also even before the mission is finished, we'll probably discover something unusual by this uh, probe something we didn't really expect to find on the moon, some other molecules or some other spectra of molecules that will help us colonize the moon a lot faster or will give us more reasons to go there and to actually start a manned mission. Because obviously, if this orbiter discovers a really cool element that might kickstart another mining opportunity for human race, this will definitely lead to another gold rush and everyone will start building lunar colonies everywhere. And that's of course how we've colonized everything to begin with. It's always really about profit and money. And although this does make us sound kind of selfish and money driven, it has uh, led to many different really awesome discoveries over the years. 
So if we do discover something really precious and unusual on the moon and this probe does it in the next seven years, it's going to be the beginning of a new era for humanity. And hopefully I'll be the first to report about this sometime in the future in one of the future videos, which is why you should be subscribing. And also share this video with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe even support this channel on Patreon and space out and as always, bye bye.